Well, welcome. Uh, so excited to have you with us. We are ending our series on the truth about lies. And we've taken the last four weeks to, uh, maybe five weeks to unpack this idea um, that we are all wrestling with lies. And uh, we can't just let them invade our mind. We have to do something about it. And so let me give you a recap. Jump right into the last couple weeks. Uh, is, this, is this off? Is this, was this on? It was on? You want to do this while I, maybe it's the power buttons or something, but let me give you a recap. It should be up there on the screen. Uh, the last couple of weeks, we looked at three main lies, and uh, these lies are the lies that we got back from folks who were in the church, in this body. Number one, uh, I'm not good enough and will never be. I'm not good enough and will never be. Uh, number two, God is not for me and does not love me. And then last week, um, not Netflix, uh, <laughs> Or maybe that's the Lord speaking. I don't know. Uh, I don't belong and I'm better off on my own. I don't belong and I am better off on my own. And I can't tell you last week the amount of stories that came out of such a beautiful time of communion doing it together up here. But the amount of stories that came out of people um, saying not only was that message like word for word what I was struggling with, um, but it was such a heavy burden on their hearts that was keeping them from community. Uh, and it just showed me how much the enemy wants to lie to people so that he can isolate us, like we talked about, so that we become more vulnerable to his attacks. And I just want to kind of knock out one testimony from last week. This is a quote from somebody in the church. They said it this way to me. They said, I was not engaging in church for months because I thought I was not worthy of the love here. I was not worthy of the love here. And I just want to say that that person is not alone in thinking that. There were so many people that had that kind of idea. I'm not worthy to be here. I'm better off on my own. Um, I, I, don't, I don't belong in this body. It's been too long. I can't walk in here. And uh, I, I want to let you know that, that that is exactly what Satan, that's exactly where Satan wants you to be because he knows that believing these lies will keep us from all that God has for us in Christ and through his people. That's what's at stake if we believe these lies. And, and this is so rampant, these kind of lies. Uh, man, even in our prayer huddle this morning, it's just, we can just see that there's people wrestling with lies and they are coming at a, at a barrage constantly in our minds. And we're having to battle them daily. And sometimes we just are too tired to battle them. And so we just let them rattle around rent-free in our minds. And they do a lot of damage. Um, most of the pain, oftentimes, a lot of the pain that we go through is self-inflicted because we've allowed these lies to stay in our minds and not have fought them with the gospel. And so Satan wants to keep us from all that God has for us in Christ. But I was thinking about this as we end, because we're not going to touch on a lie today. We're going to touch on kind of how to fight these lies. It kind of shocked me that, that you and I, if you call the movement your home, or maybe you're a guest and, and you love Jesus, maybe you don't know Jesus, all good. Uh, most of the people in this room that have come the last four weeks, you know the truths that we have covered. Nothing that I have shared has been um, surprising. It, has, it hasn't been shocking. Uh, it has been encouraging, and it has done war against those lies because we need to hear those. But nothing is new. And so I just started asking myself the question, if you and I know these lies and know the truth to these lies, then why do we keep falling back into believing them? That's such a question, a weighty question we have to answer. What is, there's something missing, can you see, in, in how we're handling these. If you know the truth and you can even rehearse and recite the truth that goes against the lie that the enemy is tempting you with, and yet you're not able to get out of that lie, you're trapped in it, or you go back to it. So you hear the truth. And I, I, don't, I don't doubt that some people have heard these truths wash over them the last few weeks. And I've heard testimony on testimony of God freeing them. But I know some of us maybe have gone right back into that. Why? Because one, Satan is cunning. He knows exactly how to get us. Remember, Satan was tempting Jesus. And he said that he left him for a more opportune time. He knows exactly when to attack you. He knows the weak spots. He knows. It's, it's intentional. It's not general. And so he knows. 
So you might be on a high thinking you're off, your, your guard is off, and then bam, the lie comes in, and you are feeling the same way. So the question has to be asked, why do we keep on going back to this or feel this over and over again? I want to put before you, I don't think that is um, the, the reality for every Christian. It doesn't have to be, at least. I don't think you will ever stop being attacked. You, you will never stop being attacked. But you can stop falling into those lies and letting them run in your mind rent-free. Amen? You can stop that. That is under your control. You can't control the attacks. You can not control how the attacks influence you. And that's why I'm concerned this morning um, enough to kind of address this one more week because I want to make sure we have a practical kind of guide on how to move forward so we don't just have the truths to the few lies we talked about. We have a way to practice And so the question I want to answer today is really simple. How do we guard ourselves from believing the lies of the enemy? How do we guard ourselves from believing the lies of the enemy? We've talked about it, but how do we move forward in such a way that when those things come, because they will, they might might be happening right now, they might happen later at home church, they might happen on a Monday morning, they might happen when you're at work, they're going to come no matter what. So how do you put yourself in a position to not be as attacked or as influenced by these. I'm so thankful for God's word. I don't know how often you look into the scriptures. We have a daily reading plan at the church, the abide plan. You can see that at the movement.church slash abide, and maybe you're doing your own plan, but I hope you are in God's word because you're gonna find out this is a treasure of how to do battle against enemies, against the enemy. And if we don't go here, we're looking at places that aren't as strong. So would you stand with me as we read God's word? We're gonna see in this few verses what God says about how to guard ourselves from believing the lies of the enemy. It's found in Ephesians. And this is gonna be a a passage that might seem kind of weird to read for this context. But there's something in here that stood out this last week that I wanna share. Um, So let's read it all together on three. One, two, three. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Amen. This is the word of God. You may be seated. This is the word of God, and there is so much here for us this morning. You might have seen some of the things we're going to talk about, but so much here. And so let me just give you an outline for how we're going to break down. We're going to go kind of studying maybe three or four verses. I want to address the problem, and this is not a new problem, but I wanted you, I think this verse, this passage addresses the problem, describes the problem we've been talking about the last few weeks, lies, in such a way that I think it, it, it illustrates it. Uh, with freshness and clarity, and it shows what's at stake if we believe these lies. Then we'll go to the solution. It's very clear in the passage, and I'm excited to kind of think through it in, in a practical way because I don't think we're thinking about this as we think about lies. And so I'm looking forward to getting practical as Paul does. Then we'll think about the content has to do with the solution and then the results. So let me give you some context. Because we jumped into this passage, and, and you're probably wondering, what does this all have to do with lies? There's a lot going on, equipping saints, building stuff up, maturity. There's, there's a lot going on. And this is what Paul is talking about. And we mention this verse often in, in different ways at the church. The context is that Jesus Christ appoints leaders to the church. He says apostles, prophets, shepherds, leaders. He appoints leaders to the church to equip the saints so that the body is built up and all move from immaturity to maturity in Christ. That's the context you need to know, that, that God has sent these leaders, pastor, prophets, different kind of roles in the church, so that I'm not doing the ministry, 
I am equipping the saints, which is you, the body of Christ, to be built up and do the ministry so that all of us would move from immaturity to maturity. That's the key I want you to see. God has said, I designed the church in such a way that from the leaders and the body to body, everyone finds a way to be built up and goes from child to manhood and womanhood, from, from immaturity to maturity. That's the context. Paul's concern is that people grow up in Jesus. Now, what does this have to do with fighting lies? Well, if you look at the next verse in verse 14, he says this, so that you will no longer be children tossed to and fro. And when he says children, he doesn't mean children in the good way this time. Jesus talked about children coming to him in a good way, with humility and openness and receptivity. This is not the word. This means an immaturity and naivety. No longer be children. What Paul is saying is that immaturity in Christ leads to disciples being tossed around against their will and to their own destruction. Paul is saying that because people are immature in the church, people now, because of all these ideas coming in, the lies and the teachings of the age, are being tossed around like a paper boat on an ocean in the midst of a storm. They're being tossed around. Now, if you think about waves, they have no control of what direction they go. The wind tells them where to go. The wind tells them what to do. They never get to stop on their own accord. The waves are, are submitted to the wind. And Paul is saying, if you are immature in Christ, you are risking being tossed around against your will to your own destruction. Look at what he says, a different version of this verse. He says, I hope that everyone will be built up in Christ so then we won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. You see how Paul is saying here, he's building an argument. I want you in the church to be rooted and grounded in Jesus, mature, not immature, mature, not just you're saved. It's one thing to be saved, but how many of you know you can be saved and be immature? And, and, and that's nothing wrong. I mean, God doesn't love you less. You're not in the kingdom less, but do you... You are more vulnerable the more you are immature. And Paul is saying because you are staying immature and you're not growing, for whatever reason, you are more influenced for every wind of teaching. So a new idea comes, a new teaching, a new podcast, a new philosophy, a new TikTok reel, whatever it is that's influencing you, it comes. And because you're immature, you're not rooted. So you go that way and you go this way and you're always changing. So Paul says, because there's always a new idea and there's always a new thought and teaching, immature disciples are susceptible to entertain these things often. We're whipped around to our own ruin. You pick one idea and this sounds good and the next thing you hear that's different, you go to that. And that is, that's exhausting to move around that often. And it causes instability. It causes doubt. And I think one thing we're not noticing the enemy wants to do is it causes insecurity. Insecurity in who you are in Christ, insecurity in who you are in God's kingdom, insecurity in who you are in the body of the church, because you're never rooted in the truth. You're always moving from it to one thing to another. And because we shift like Paul is saying, we're immature, we're, we become unstable in our view of selves, our, we're unstable in our view of God, we're unstable in our view of others. And that explains why some moments we can go from happy, joyful, content, confident, and next moment feeling like everything is lost. You ever been there? One moment you're high, next moment you're really low, and you're wondering, how did I get there? Now, one explanation is we have emotions and they run a gamut of, of, of range, and that's that's human nature based on circumstances. But the other reason is because there's things coming and rattling around in our mind that we're allowing to be there, that we're grappling onto, and it's taking us in places we don't want to go. And then we live unsettled and vulnerable. And one of the consequences is that we're always drifting from, slowly, from God's truth. Um, we were in a boat yesterday, San Pablo Reservoir, pretty close to here, took a family out and I love being on the water, and it's this big kind of party cruise boat thing, and um, it seems really like adventurous, but it probably goes like 10 miles per hour, 5 miles per hour. But the wind in your hair, you feel like you're flowing. And so uh, we're on there, but I put the anchor down. But guess what happened? I put the anchor down, but the anchor did not hit into the ground. So next thing you know, 
five minutes later, we're 400 feet away from where I thought I was. I put an anchor at some point because I wanted to be at a certain point. But because I didn't really have an anchor down, the waves took me and the wind took me in a place I did not want to go. And I ended up being in a place I didn't plan to be. How much of it is because of, in, in our personal lives, we have no anchor down because of immaturity in the gospel and the truth. And next thing you know, we wake up and we're 20 yards, 50 feet, four weeks away. We're away from relationships, whatever. We're so distanced We've drifted slowly without noticing away from the place of security and truth in who God calls us to be. Drifting is slow. Drifting is slow on purpose. And that is such the enemy's tactics to make it seem like nothing is wrong until you wake up and you look like you're so far from where you want to be because of that. And so the question is, how do we protect ourselves from this happening because I, I don't know if you want to live like this. I don't want to live like this where I'm restless, unstable, and every new idea, every new teaching, every new thought just whips me around. I want to be steady and secure. I want to grow up in Christ. And Paul talks about something very simple and striking about how to do this. It's in verse 15. He says this. Therefore, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into Christ. Speaking the truth in love. So let me paint the picture. Paul is saying, this is Paul's words, this is God's word to us. The remedy to being tossed around by lies is to commit to proclaiming and confessing God's truth to one another in relationships. See, I, I'm tempted to, I was tempted to make this sermon something that you can do for yourself. But Paul's remedy to us fighting against the deceitful schemes of the culture and the enemy and the lies is not something you do for yourself. It's something you do for others. Wow. Proclaiming and confessing God's truth to one another. Now, look at this. He says, speaking the truth in love. There's something there we have to understand. Truth without love means no context or care. If you speak truth to somebody, but you have no love, that means you probably have no relational connection, no intention to care for them, and so you don't know what kind of truth they need. You just throw out truth. And at that moment, truth becomes something that hurts them more than helps them because you don't know what they need. It's like a bomb, and you're not called to throw bombs on people, more uh, almost like a scalpel. What do they need in that moment Versus destroying everything because you're just dumping all this truth on them. And so Paul is very aware. You see those people on the side of the street having picket signs. They might have signs that say the right things. If you don't believe in Jesus, you go to hell. That's a, that's a very basic element of the truth. But that's true. But is that working? I, I don't know. I don't think so. They're, I don't think, and they might say it out of love. But see, love brings you close to the person you're talking to. And when you have to be close to the person you're talking to, you have to know them. And you have to care for them. You have to have trust between each other. And so it doesn't allow us to speak truth from far away. Put it on Twitter, put it on Facebook, put it on IG stories and blast people. That's no help. That's not the way of God. But the other way is so true. That love without truth means there's no change or no help. And some people, you might be on the right side, a fundamentalist. You've got to give them truth, but we don't care about how they feel. And the other person is, we've got to give them love, but we don't want to hurt their feelings. And both people are actually hurting the person they're talking to, just in different ways. Because love without truth means that you're not giving them what they need. And I love Jesus. He's the perfect human, which means he didn't just become perfect. He is perfect. And it means everything he did was perfect. So we should watch how he lived his life. Did he offend people? Did, did, did Jesus offend people? Yes, he offended people. Um, but he was always loving. So that means that he spoke the truth in love. Sometimes speaking the truth in love will offend someone. Their outcome and their, and their reaction is not, is not always connected to your motive. It might just be offend. I've had people speak the truth in love and I've been offended. But it was what the offense actually revealed the area that I needed the truth to sink into. And actually, I was able to take the offense because it wasn't even their motive. It was the reaction of my flesh. And I know they loved me so much that they spoke it into my life and it helped me to change. We want to love people and we want to give them the truth to move them from where they're at. And this is why, church, we gather every Sunday. We teach God's word weekly. We meet to pray weekly. We share meals together. 
This is why we need the body of Christ. And this is why I said it last week. This is why isolation is so deadly. Not just dangerous, deadly. Because Paul is not saying here, and this is, I guess self-talk is great, but Paul is not saying speak the truth to yourself. He's saying speak the truth to one another. And there's something about a communal element as we fight this war together that you need. And you need other people to speak the truth to you and know you. I need people that know me, that know I'm ratchet. Come on, somebody. And, uh, and can speak into those areas with such love, but also such boldness. You and I don't need mere flattery. You don't need flattery. You need someone that loves you so much, they're going to say the thing you need to say. And you can tell real quick if you're immature, your love, but you can tell you're immature in Christ. If when a brother or sister speaks the truth in love, I'm not saying it won't hurt, speak the truth in love, and you react in a way that is uh, defensive and that is um, so offended that you don't receive it. That just shows you, not them, it shows you something about yourself. It's throwing a mirror up to see your own immaturity. And I've done that so many times. God turned the mirror on myself so I can see where I was needing the truth. This is what I want to say about why we need one another. This is maybe something you're not thinking about, but I know when I read this statement, you will say yes and amen because I've experienced it so well. Oftentimes, you and I, this is why we need to speak the truth to one another. We are too weak and distracted to speak to ourselves what we need to truly hear. We're too weak. See, if you're believing a lie, it's, it's hard to tell yourself the truth in those moments. Now, can you speak the truth to yourself? Yes, and you should. But at some moments, you are too distracted and weak to speak to yourselves. And if we do say it to ourselves, you're going to often distrust it. Because if you're believing a lie so deeply, then you're going to second guess the things you're even saying to yourself. So at that moment, what do you do? Well, you need something from outside of yourself. Hence why the body of Christ is so important. That's why we need to stay close to one another. In moments of delusion, when we are confused and being whipped around by every doctrine and scheme and lie, God's truth often must come from the outside. And that's why we're created to hear it and receive it. Romans says faith comes from what? Hearing the word of God. Now, yes, I think that's possible that you can speak it to yourself, but I think it's actually much more powerful when someone speaks it over and to you. And if you're waiting for you just to get enough strength to speak it to yourself and you get to that point, but now you're isolating yourself because you don't even need anybody, you're going to hurt yourself and let the lie stay longer. And God says, no, no, you're actually going to need to hear the word spoken over you from your brothers and sisters who know you so well. Now, what I love about this is it assumes two things. Speaking the truth assumes that we initiate conversations. It means that we know each other so well that we can, we're able to move into someone's relational orbit and say something to them that they might need. It might be not a hard word, but an encouraging word. Oftentimes, I'm sending text out to people just to remind them and affirm them of who they are and how grateful I am and God is to them. Why? Because I need it and they need to hear it. Now, I need the same thing that is spoken to me. I need to initiate conversations. If I know someone's struggling, the thing I'm going to do is remind them of God's truth. But it doesn't just mean always initiating. It also assumes that you're listening to others. Some of you, because of your personality, you're like, yeah, speak the truth in love. And you're, you're already thinking about people who you're going to go and talk to. But some of you, if you're thinking that, you need to be the person that stops and also listens and humbles yourself to others. Because in the body of Christ, you give and you receive. You take action and you humble yourself. And there's not one action that's for you and not for the other person. You need to always have this continual step of I'm going to initiate and then I'm going to stop back, step back and receive. And this is what relationships are built on. It's a give and take. That's why he says speak the truth in love. Speak the truth in love. That means that you're willing to receive and you're willing to give. And that's why everyone is needed here because you're not just giving, you're not just receiving, you're doing both. Speak the truth in love. Now, I'm going to take a little, sh not shortcut, but just different route real quick. And I felt led just to put this inside here of, of what do we mean by truth? Because that can be really general in the world, and it can be general in the church sometimes. What, do you, what, what, what does Paul mean? What does God mean? What do I mean when it says speak the truth? Because if you don't know what to say, and you're just told to say something, 
then you might hurt somebody and mislead them. So you need to know what is Paul saying when he says, speak the truth in love. Speaking the truth in love, it means this is not your truth and your ideas. You might have good opinions and good ideas, but when someone is hurting and being deceived by a lie, they really don't need your opinions. They, I love you. You love them. It's great. People don't need you to send a podcast or a YouTube video. They need to hear what God is saying. And, and why send a, a video of someone else speaking God's word? They need to hear it from a brother who knows them. You see, when you hear God's word from someone who doesn't know you, you're more apt not to believe it or receive it. Because Satan comes in and says, they don't know you, it's not for you. But when you hear God's word spoken in the context of relationships to what you need to hear in that moment, because the Holy Spirit told them to say it, and they know you, and they come to you, they know how ratchet you are, they know how busted you are, and they say, here, brother, I love you so much, here's what God is saying to you. I want to affirm you of your identity, remind you of who God says you are. You know how much that matters to you? You know how much that means when someone comes to me, and they know me, and they say exactly what the Spirit tells them to say with God's word? Wow. And here's the danger. Some of us, we're listening you're li- because you will share what your mind is filled with. And so you might not be able to share God's word because you're filling your mind with podcasts, TikTok reels, IG stories. And I'm not against social media, but I am against it if it's going to keep you being out of God's word. Because you have limited capacity, so you have to choose every moment what you're doing with the time you have. And if you are influenced by other people who don't care about you, who don't even know right doctrine, then you're going to be drifting away. And if you're drifting away, then what are you going to be giving to another person? You only give what you have. And God's word is God's word, but if you don't have it implanted in you, what do you have to give? You have to be in this so that when the spirit prompts you in the moment, it comes out of you naturally. You know it. The more I read and abide in God's word, the more in those moments God brings up the verse. I don't even care if you know the reference. The truth to say to someone in that moment who needs it. I'm so thankful of people who have lived in God's word and breathed God's word so that when I'm going through something, they can just speak, not their opinion, but God's truth. And that rests my heart. That brings me calmness. That brings me confidence. And that's what you and I need in those moments. We don't need it. Well, I think you should do this. No, no, no. You need it. This is what God says. Let me remind you about what God has done. That's the truth that we're called to say. Now, let me go a little bit deeper. This truth is not, I don't think, just the general word of God. Is, is that part of it? Yes. Any part of God's word that needs to be spoken to one another, there's so much in here that's applicable to everything that we're going through. Everything the Bible talks about will line up at some point to what you and I were going through. But this is not primarily the general truth of God, but the triumphant word of the gospel of Jesus in all its facets. When I'm saying, what Paul is saying is, speak the gospel truth in love to one another. How do I know that? Because Paul had just been taking two chapters, half the letter, to explain the gospel. So that when he gets to this point, now he's talking about the implications of the gospel. He's saying this is the source material. Study it, know it, breathe it, eat it, live it, so that you can share it. So that you can share it. Now, if you are saying, Chris, I'm just, we need to move on from the gospel. It, it's boring. Yeah, it, it's, just, it's great. I love Jesus. I'm saved. We need like deeper things. Then, then you misunderstand the gospel. Because oftentimes we, we truncate the gospel down to one idea, that Jesus came to die for me so I can get out of hell. And while the gospel is not any more less than this, it is always more than this. The gospel is never less than Jesus dying to save you from hell and wrath but it's always more. And if you stay on that, I'm just saved to get out of hell and miss everything else, then you won't be able to get the richness of what Jesus has done and give it to other people who need it. Every week that I've preached about these lies, the truth was simply a part of the gospel spoken against the lie. And so what Paul is saying is that we would do the same thing. Now, I wanna take just maybe three minutes just to give you Another glimpse of the gospel. Is that okay with you? 
I want to just put it before you so you're freshly reminded of what we're talking about. Because I'm not saying sit down and talk for 10 minutes on what the gospel is to every single person God tells you to speak the truth and love to. I'm saying there's going to be an aspect of the gospel that someone needs to hear that because you know it so well, you're able to say it and it will, it will impact them in ways that will free them from the change that they are bound to. So let me just lay out the real gospel. We don't want a truncated gospel. We want the real gospel. Number one, God created you in love and loves you deeply. You got to start there. You don't start at sin. You start at God created you in love and loves you deeply. Sin corrupted you and separated you from God. This is all part of the gospel. And then God humbled himself in the person of Jesus to save you. Mind-blowing. God humbled himself in the person of Jesus. He was perfect, righteous, and never sinned. You can trust him. He never sinned. He died in your place, taking your deserved punishment. You and I deserved the wrath of God because of our sin, and Jesus took it willingly. And he saved you by grace, which means you don't get to beat your chest being proud that you deserved it. You didn't deserve it. It was a gift. All you did was receive it. And because of that, you were completely forgiven of every sin and blemish, past, present, and future. That is a part of the beautiful gospel. But there's more. Somebody say there's more. more. Not just forgiven, you are made righteous and completely clean before God. So you're not just from negative to zero, you're at a million. Do you understand that? You're not just unforgiven, now you're given everything you need to be in confidence to walk in all that God has for you. That's why Hebrews says, enter the throne room with boldness and confidence. Why? How dare you enter God's throne room and accept because you are so righteous and he loves you, you are welcomed in as a son and daughter. Before, they would be killed if they entered in that way. But because you are loved and saved and washed clean and righteous, you're welcome into the throne room. And you now have the Holy Spirit of God empowering you. You're not alone. God has come to dwell in you as the new temple. You're adopted into God's family, the church. We talked about last week. You have family now. You don't just relate to God as a father. Now you have brothers and sisters that you share the, G- the blood of Jesus with. Because of that, you have an indestructible inheritance and hope in heaven. That's why it doesn't matter what your 401k is, your Roth IRA, your, your house, your equity. You have something that someone can't touch in heaven, protected because of Jesus. And the promise is that Jesus is coming back to make all things right and good. So something might not be right right now, and it might not ever be right in this world, but Jesus promises to make all wrongs right and all the sad things come untrue. And because of that, one day, you and I will live in a new and perfect world for eternity. He's not coming to destroy the world. He's coming to remake the world because it was broken. And the revelation says, God, there will be no sun because God himself is the sun. In this new world, you will see God face to face. There will be no fogginess and confusion and hiddenness of God. You will see God face to face and dwell with him and others forever. That is the real and whole gospel. Only that can be the antidote to help us fight against the lies. Only the real and whole gospel can be enough to combat, combat the lies of not being good enough, the lies of God not being for us, and the lies that we do not belong in community. You have to know, Movement Church, the gospel is the real power that you have in your hands to give to someone else. And so, yes, the truth of God's word always applies everything. But because the truth of God's word climaxes in the gospel, you need to know the gospel, to give it to other people. And again, you will not be able to give what you don't first have. And so if you have a truncated version of the gospel, you will not have the well of riches and resources to give to someone else when they need it. And so it's, it's actually apparent that all of us need to grow up in Christ, like Paul says, so we all rehearse the gospel constantly and live in it so that as it comes out of our mouth more naturally, we're all encouraged and the whole tide of the church rises. Because as you know more of the gospel, it will come out so someone else will know more of the gospel. And what I love about the gospel is you can't just remind someone once. How many times, guess guess how many times your pastor has to be reminded of the gospel? Someone shout something out. More than every day. Yes, I, I forget so often. Israel forgot 
so often that in the Psalms, there's so many times when it says they forgot who God was and forgot that God saved them and they wandered off. Their forgetfulness made them wander. Your forgetfulness of what Jesus has done and who he made you to be makes you wander. And so that's what we just read about, that you're a wave on the ocean tossed by the wind. You're wandering. But having someone who loves you, who speaks the truth in love, say, man, I know what you need. Let me speak the gospel to you. Let me remind you that you're adopted. Let me remind you of your identity. Let me remind you there's no condemnation in Jesus. Let me remind you, you don't have to clean up before entering into this place. When someone speaks those words, they do more than anything can do for our hearts. So let me ask you some questions. Do you think about the gospel often? Or is it in your mind something you can move on from? Do you see the gospel as the only antidote? Because if not, you'll start using other things and your wisdom and other people. Look what Jordan Peterson said. That's great that Jordan Peterson said that. That's great that Oprah said that. That's great that whatever teacher you're listening to, is Oprah still alive? Um, it's, great that, uh, it's great that you have that. But is the gospel the only antidote? So at the end of the day, while you're giving wisdom, people need the truth and the truth of Jesus. Do you put yourself in situations to listen. It's not just speaking and encouraging people, but are you putting yourself in positions where your mouth is shut, your ears are open, and you're allowing people to get close enough to you to know you and to speak to you? That, makes, that means that you have to be vulnerable. Vulnerability is scary. But the moment you open up and you entrust that to God and one another, God it gets you, God comes close to the brother and sister that says a word that means so much, that warms your cold heart. And then lastly, do you listen and watch things that feed the lies? Because if you're listening and watching things that is feed, are feeding the lies, then you will not have the reservoir that you need to speak the gospel truth to somebody in that moment. First Timothy, I think it's first or second Timothy, Paul is talking about a house. And he says, in this house, there are vessels of uh, dishonor and vessels of honor. There's like gold vessels and silver vessels. And what he's saying, not salvation. Everyone's saved in this house as these vessels. But he says, the one who is clean will be used by God, by the master. And what that says to me is that the one who is walking by the Holy Spirit in holiness, following Jesus, not perfectly, but closely, that person is ready to be used by God at any moment. The one who's not walking close with God, they are still loved and saved and forgiven but you might not be ready at the moment called to be used by God. God loves you, but not everyone. He loves everyone equally. He doesn't use everyone equally. And I want to be used by God. My commitment to this church, my commitment to my wife, is that I would do what I can in my own strength to surrender my life to Jesus' will so that I can be used by God because the God's kingdom comes through you. And the more you're walking with Jesus, the more you're in line with Jesus, the more your eyes are looking at things that are like Jesus and ears that are listening to Jesus and mind that is on Jesus and your affections are towards him, the more you're ready at the moment to be used by God. Let me tell you, being used by God is not just feeling good for yourself while it makes you feel good. It's for the sake of others. So I need you to live a holy life and be ready to be used by God in Christ so that any moment when I'm down, you're ready to be used by God to speak a word to me and vice versa. Now let me say a few last words as we wrap up to the result. This won't work if it's just on Sundays, folks. If it's just me giving you the gospel from a leader on stage or in a small group or a prayer night, this will not work. It must be throughout the week, body to body, member to member, saint to The saint, let me say it clearly, the gospel is yours and I's new language. And we have to learn how to speak it fluently for the sake of one another. The gospel is our new language as brothers and sisters in God's kingdom. And we have to learn how to speak it fluently for the sake of one another. This is not just about you and the Lord now. This is about you growing up in Christ so that you can have maturity to speak the gospel to one another so that everyone grows up in Christ. And while I love talking about sports and media and entertainment, let me just say a word that was on my heart. I don't think it is ever helpful to know more about what the princess or duchess of Wales is doing than what Jesus has done. I just don't know how that's helpful. Is it entertaining? Sure. Is it makes you make you laugh and, and fill your mind with things? Sure. But come on, we are called to live differently than the world. 
Not because we have to to earn something, but because we've been such gifted God's grace that we want to live differently in his kingdom. We're on mission. Other people that don't love Jesus, they, they, they're great people, but they're on a cruise ship. There's no mission. We're on a mission. You were called to be on mission in the church and outside the church. And the gospel is how you get to use um, the weapons that you have on this mission for the good of others. Here's the result that Paul promises. If we're speaking the truth in love, he says, we are to grow up in every way into him. Anyone want to grow up in every way into Christ? Grow up in every way, not just one way. You grow up in every way into him who is the head. He's the head, we're the body. We're growing up into him. And Paul says, if we speak the truth in love, we will attain the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. That's the goal, that we have this unity of faith. What does that mean? That we're unified in what we believe, that we are unified in what we know about Jesus so that we mature and we start to look more and more like Jesus. This thought hit me the other day that you, you and I cannot be more enamored with the work we're doing for God than the work that God is doing in us. And that means this one thing. God's main work in your life isn't what you are doing for other people. It's what he's doing in you to make you more like Christ. That's Romans 8.28. You were chosen, predestined, and sanctified so that you would be conformed to the image of Jesus. Conformed, transformed to look like Christ. That's where all joy and peace and power is in looking more like Jesus. That's his work in you. And so as we speak the truth and love to one another, it helps the whole body grow. When we combine confessing of the gospel truths in the context of real, lived out, and loving relationships, it results in the body of Christ growing up and maturing, which in turn protects us from the ever-shifting lies of the enemy in the world. Bluntly, can I put it bluntly? You do not have what it takes on your own to fight the enemy. I was driving here this morning, and the Lord just put the scripture in my heart. It's two chapters later, Ephesians 6. I'm going to end with this. And Paul's talking about the armor of God. And he says, beware because you are in a spiritual war and we do not fight the spiritual war with fleshly weapons, but with spiritual weapons. I want to just put before you, this is not peacetime. You're in a war. And if you live in a war like it's peacetime, you're going to get taken out so quickly. And some of us think we're living in peacetime when we're living in a war. So we wonder why all these things keep happening. Nothing is wrong with you. Nothing is wrong with God. Nothing is wrong with the church. Yeah, we're imperfect. No, you're in a war and you have an enemy. And you need to know that. But I find so interesting, the one thing that the Bible says at the offensive, because there's a whole bunch of armor of God lists of defensive. The belt of truth, which is the word of God. The breastplate of righteousness. The feet of the gospel. Uh, the shield of faith. All these things point to the gospel. But what he says is, and then take up the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now, if you're in a battle, and not in this day, but back in the day, battles, if you were going into war, you would know your sword is not just for you. Your sword is also to help use to fight for others. And if you're sitting here just sharpening your sword just for yourself, it's not helpful. Paul says, I want you to take up the sword, not just for yourself, but to fight on behalf of others. What an opportunity. You and I, with the gospel and the word of truth and the sword of the spirit, get to fight on behalf of one another. Let me ask you a question, Movement Church. Are you going to war for one another? That's what Paul is asking here, that you would be ready, take up, be strong in the Lord, in the strength of his might, take up the armor, go to war, but not just for yourself to protect yourself, so you do good for the sake of the brother and sister next to you. Your sword is also used to fight for others. If you're wondering, man, I, don't, I, just, I hear this, but, but, but how is this going to defeat Satan, how is this going to help protect me? I'm still going to have these lies come. Well, I love this verse in Revelation 12. One of the last things of the Bible, it says this about those who were martyred, those who gave their lives for Jesus, those who were following Christ. And it says this, they have conquered Satan by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. They conquered Satan. How? Do you want to conquer Satan? Yes, we want to conquer. We don't want to sit there and be attacked. We want to conquer, and not in your own strength, in Christ, but they conquered Satan, one, by the blood of the lamb. What's that? The gospel. 
And number two, the word of their testimony. What's your testimony? It's not how good you've been in church. It's not good. It's not how well you've done in your life. The testimony is how God saved you through the gospel, though you didn't deserve it, and now has empowered you to live a whole new life. That's your testimony. And you get to be, you get to use the blood of the lamb, which is Jesus, and the word of your testimony to fight Satan. Anything less than that will not work. Anything less than that will not work. And so what I'm calling you, church, is not just to try to live on your own path and be busy with your own things. You've got, you got to live for the sake of others, and not only when it's convenient, but when it's not convenient. Because Jesus lived for the sake of others when it wasn't convenient for him. So yes, you got your own agendas and plans and, and sports and, and entertainment and business and all those things. you got to juggle that yourself as God leads you. But I'm never going to stop calling you to live a life self selflessly, sacrificially for the sake of others in this church and outside of this church. You have a sword. Sharpen it and use it for the sake of others. Someone needs to hear the gospel through your voice. Don't believe. Don't believe you don't have a voice. This is not your voice anyways. It's God's word, which means you're a vessel for that word to go to somebody. I don't care if you've been struggling. Sometimes I need to lead my heart to say the thing that I'm not believing to warm my heart. Anybody else there? I need to say the thing to somebody else to not just bless them, but to remind me. Because if I'm just speaking in my head, I get stuck in my head. But you need to hear and speak the word of God. That is how the gospel grows. One final admonition. You and I cannot let the enemy speak death to your brothers and sisters around more than we speak life in the gospel to them. The enemy is constantly speaking to your neighbor on the left and right, and you know he's speaking to you constantly. That is why he does what he does, to deceive you and make you walk away and doubt. But you cannot let the enemy speak more. You and I have to commit to out-speaking, out-sharing, out-talking the enemy with the good news. The enemy constantly yapping in our ears, let's go one up and constantly be sharing the gospel with one another. I know it's great to laugh and have fun and, and have those conversations, but can you imagine people are sometimes laughing because they're so hurt, they want to numb their pain. And they want to ignore and avoid the issues that they're struggling with. And you have to have discernment in the spirit to know sometimes people, they don't need to laugh. They might, but they're probably hurting. Everyone's carrying a burden. And they, what they might need the most is an affirmation of what Jesus has done for them and who Jesus made them to be. You don't know what one word can do for somebody. You don't know what one, one word from you has done to me. A text, a letter, something in passing. We're not talking about preaching sermons. We're talking about letting the language of Christ be on your tongue. So as the Spirit uses you, he builds one another up. Out talk the enemy with good news. And I believe the whole body of Jesus will rise and the whole sea and tide will rise because of that. So here's what I want you to do. I don't have a specific question about the sermon as much as a reflection. I am curious for your sake and for the neighbor's sake, what is the one thing God is convicting you of or encouraging you of right now? One reflection. Because I know there's a lot of different ways. Maybe you can share a story of how you've been blessed by this. Maybe you can share man, how, you, how you've needed this and you didn't hear anyone speaking the word. Maybe there's a conviction in your heart to speak up more and to use your voice because you had the spirit. Whatever it is, I, I want to be able to encourage one another in this moment and not just leave this to fall. What is one reflection from the teaching that hits home the most for you? You're locked and loaded together as the body of Jesus, so let's do life together in this moment. Let's be open because the gospel is on your tongue. Let's speak it to one another. So let's get in groups two to three. Let's share this one reflection, and then we're going to come and pray and worship the Lord and have the gospel preached over us through song. Just want to um, close us out with some uh, announcements um, before we leave here. Uh, you guys can take a seat. Um, first big thing is we have an upcoming game night lock-in at the Family Ministry Center coming up on July 20th, 21st, sorry. And so um, if you've got kids who are uh, in that age range, youth range, um, we would love for you to invite them or even if they have friends that want to come out. I remember they did this last year, and it was just so much fun. It was like one of the highlights I remember for the kids. They had so much fun during this lock-in. So um, use this as an opportunity. 
to invite a friend to come out and uh, really the kids just have that moment where they get to hang out in community overnight. Um, I think it's a very sweet, sweet thing as a kid to just have that bonding moment. So please um, put that on your calendars. Uh, next, I want to go over Serve Week. If you've got your phones with you, please scan this QR, QR code so you can sign up and volunteer. I just want to share a vision. Why do we do this? And the reason we do this, right, is because Jesus came not to be served, but to serve, right? And so our role model is in Jesus. And all the years we've done this has been a blessing for the school. And it's not just a blessing for the school, but it's a blessing for us the ones who get to participate in serving, right? There's something about that. When you serve others, God works in that. He meets you in there. And sometimes we uh, forget a little bit of our own problems and our own circumstances when we get to see the bigger picture, right, what God is doing in the community. So I encourage you, come out to serve um, July 31st, August 2nd at Elmhurst here, and then August 2nd to 4th at Life Academy, which is not that far off either, about five to seven minute drive near Fruitvale, okay? So encourage you guys to sign up and serve. Finally, um, we've got home church later. Um, the original plan was to have my home and Monica's home open, but things have changed a little bit. So it's just my home open now. So you guys are all invited to come over. Um, and then if you guys want to go out for lunch, I think MJ, Jana may be going out to a meal in Alameda. So if you guys are interested to do that, feel free to um, talk to MJ or Jana. Um, with that, let me just leave you with a blessing. Um, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and give you peace. And that you would go forth from here just with the delight that God is working, right? That God is working in our hearts. So go out with that same joy and delight and bless others this week. Amen? All right. You guys are dismissed for church.